cuddly rescue bear. Um, the bear is in progress of being a cuddly rescue bear. Um, my part to this project was to try and make it walk and keep the head stable. I don't know how you're supposed to rescue something unless you're able to walk. Well, in a bear's case. Um, and keeping the head stable, well, it's a good idea if you can actually see who you're trying to save instead of walking all over them. So, that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Now, I came across this bear in one of my technical advisor's offices at Newcastle. I saw it on his desk and I'm like, oh, it's a bear. Now, if you've ever seen my room, every cupboard is full of teddy bear. Well, the top of them are full of teddy bears. This is my 21st birthday. I had a teddy bear's picnic and the little guy there is my nephew. The second thing I noticed, it's a robot. Now, in third year, I put 10 volts into a 5 volt input, among other things. I then realized that I shouldn't touch hardware. I should stick to software. Low level software is a very good place to be. It runs Linux. <laughs> Sorry, it runs Linux. <laughs> so, after talking to my super, after talking to Peter, I found out that it runs Linux, and I'm like, oh, three of my great passions all rolled into one. This is awesome. How do I get my hands on this thing? Now, a little bit about how the bear came into being. Has anyone here heard of RoboCop? Pretty close to everyone. Nice. Okay. Well, for those few who don't know what RoboCop is. You may have seen these Sony Abo dogs that run around playing soccer against each other. This was what's called the Four-Legged League. Um, it's a good competition for computer scientists and software engineers. I would have liked to have joined it too, but sadly I didn't get to. Um, it's useful because you have a standard hardware, then the competition is against the software, it's against the algorithms that you can create. Now, in January 2006, Sony announced that it was ceasing the production of the Sony AWO. This became a problem for RoboCop. What are they going to do? They ended up calling out for a tender for a standard robotic platform to replace the four-legged leak. So they didn't care whether it was four legs or two legs. They needed some standard platform. So, a collaborative tender was submitted by Newbots, which was the University of Newcastle's <laughs> Sony ABO team. Um, they have been in the finalist since 2002 for the standard for the four-legged league. Oh, yeah, that could be handy. Um, they also were the champions in 2006. Another company that was involved was Tribotics. Tribotics is a developer of robotics products and retails robotics and electrical products, as well as Cyberbotics, which is a web-based simulation program for robots. So they put together one of their proposals was this robotic bear, the other of which was a robotic dog. Their main proposal was a bear. So why a bear? Bears are big and strong in nature, which means in the electronic environment, then they can handle heavy weights such as batteries and lots of complex electronic systems. They also perform quadrupedal and bipedal motion. This means that if they're on the soccer field, then they could have all the stability of a quadruped, quadruped so be on all four legs running around while they have the ball. If they don't have the ball or if they can't find the ball, then they could stand up and look over everyone else to be able to see where the ball is. It also meant that they could use the four-legged league team strategies. They didn't have to start from scratch again. Okay. When they designed the robotic bear, they wanted to have an open hardware platform. This meant that if people wanted to, they could change the hardware, they could add stuff in, take stuff out. It was also handy, it came in a kit style as well. This was handy because 
if your beer's off an island somewhere and one of your motors breaks and one of your electronics parts breaks, you call up Tribotics and say, hey, can you send me another one of these parts? They send it out to you and you can put it in yourself. You don't have the bear being down, not being able to be programmed on for the months, weeks it takes to send them back. And you could redo them yourselves if you want to. They also wanted an open software platform. This meant that the computer scientists would be able to program right down into the operating system if they wanted to. If they didn't want to, then they could just work off the operating system that we gave them. So, how do you go about designing a robotic bear? Now, research has been done into what's being called the Uncanny Valley. The Uncanny Valley describes how people relate to what they see. Now, if something isn't very lifelike, then you don't really care what it looks like. But if it is lifelike, then we start getting very picky about what it looks like. We won't ex if it's not quite right, then we're not going to accept it. We actually get really freaked out by things that don't look quite right. An industrial robot, we don't care what it looks like. It could look like anything. It doesn't look very lifelike. So long as it does it jo its job, we're happy. Stuffed animals. Thank you, Flickr. <laughs> Stuffed animals, so long as they don't look very realistic to the animal that they're trying to emulate. So we can see that this is a Tasmanian devil, but it's not exactly a Tasmanian devil, so we're not going to get freaked out by it. Humanoid robots, while they're looking more lifelike, as you can see with the Asimov, it doesn't have a face, so it doesn't look very lifelike, and we're okay with these. We can. They can exist. We're not going to be very picky about what they look like. Things that exist in the uncanny valley. Now, as you can see on the right here, we have a taxidermy fish. Now, I don't know about you, but that sort of freaks me out a bit. Um, and Final Fantasy IV, they tried to get things lifelike. It still doesn't look quite right. <laughs> Then we get to humans. Now, apparently we're perfectly fine in accepting humans. Um, possibly this one. <laughs> but yeah. So the aim when trying to design a robotic bear is to not hit this uncanny valley, to not look like a corpse, to not look like a zombie. We can look like Rusty if we want to. <laughs> he might get freaked out by it. <laughs> what? You said to pause for a second. <laughs> okay. So, when they designed the robotic bear, it takes on some of the features of a bear, but not all of them. So you can still see it's mechanical, we're still okay to associate with it. So how do you make it look like a bear? Well, you could just add a heap of motors in there. It's not going to look like much. So we need to add some plastic on to make it look like a bear, to make it have the cute face that it has. <laughs> oh, you right? Sorry. OK. So the printing was done with something that was sort of similar to a rep wrap, except a lot more expensive. Um, this printer actually sends two laser beams into like a heap of pre-plastic stuff. And where the two laser beams hit, that's where the plastic's created. So you send it some CAD designs, and it outputs what you see here on a flat sheet of plastic. Now, the black stuff underneath is what they use to hold up the pieces while they're being formed. This black honeycomb, to get rid of it, you just put the pieces in the dishwasher and it comes out all clean. They dissolve in the dishwasher, which is 
quite nice. So now we have our final product, a cute, cuddly, robotic bear. Well, possibly not so cuddly. Now, a bit about the hardware that's inside them. The main part of the robot is the motors. Now, my suggestion would be don't get your hands caught in the motors when they want to go somewhere. These have 37.7 kgf per centimetre. Disclaimer for those who want to know what that converts to, I'm not converting it. It's a big number. They also, what's quite nice about these motors is they also daisy chain together, which means you only need one input into your microcontroller and then you connect all the other motors together and access them with different IDs. They each have their own microcontroller inside them. These store things like torque, position, speed, temperature, where you want to go, where it is at the time, and lots of other things. They're very hardy. They have a um, metal brushes inside the motor. I've never seen one of these break. I'd be quite impressed if you do break them. They have a 300 degree rotation, so for this arm, it can go from there all the way around to there. Quite sufficient for any part of the robot, really. They have a really high resolution, 0.29 degrees. You can get very, very tiny movement from sending it in one point of difference. The way to access these motors is by sending some header files. The ID of the motor, header byte, sorry. The ID of the motor that you want to get to, the length of the rest of the instruction, the parameters that you want to send. So the instruction might be read, write, ping, anything else, and then a checksum. A little bit about more of the hardware. This bear has its own computer inside of it. It's got an AMD Geo x86 processor that runs at 500 megahertz, a little bit faster than what's in the Exos, but exactly the same thing. The main problem with this geode is it only has 512 megabytes of flash disk space. Now, I don't know when the last time you tried to fit a whole operating system into 512 megabytes. It can be done with Linux, Windows struggles. <laughs> it has two Atmel and Mega 128 microcontrollers. One consists in the head, the other is in the body. These basically take sensor inputs in and they either can do some processing with them or they can send the results to the geode. Okay, the bear also has a Logitech webcam that's attached straight to the geode and which is in its nose and some OLED eyes which are basically like your computer uh, mobile phone screens in its eyes so it sees you through its nose, you see it through its eyes. It's quite bizarre. Um, also, you have the ability to control the motors in the head from the Atmel in the head. So this takes off some of the processor needed to be able to control those. So I'll go on later about the control system that I've put in the head. That's straight on the Atmel that's in the head. The geo doesn't have to worry anything about it. Okay, summing it all up, we have the microcontroller in the head, some OLED eyes, distance sensors, webcam, touch sensors, the main board, some batteries, and some motors. The operating system. Now, CompuLab, the guys who provided the geode, also provided three images to go on it, one of which was Gentoo, the other two were Windows. Now, the Gentoo image is an open source, it would have been nice, except they put crazy things like Xorg, 
touchscreen drivers, and because of the space, they decided, you don't need man files. Okay. So, we decided to take our own approach. Now, I don't know how to use Gentoo, so I stuck with something I did know. I know how to use Kubuntu. So what's something close to Ubuntu that's going to fit in 512 megabytes? We find Debian. <laughs> so a minimal install of Debian, so unticking all the things in the installation, gets you down to about 200 megabytes, probably a bit less, which leaves you 312 megabytes to write your programs on for the user to do whatever they wish with. Now, how do you get an operating system onto something that has no CD-ROM drive? Yes, I realize we could have used a USB stick, but I didn't know about that at the time. I had just heard about QMU in our local log. Now, QMU, I've been told, does really well in embedded systems. It can pro um, emulate ARM processors, et cetera, et cetera. So, we started off with QMU. We then found out that the QMU in the repositories doesn't have SCSI support at the time. Um, this became a problem because the NAND flash 512 megabytes registers as a SCSI drive. So we needed to go to the website, download the latest um, QMU, and start recompiling. To emulate the geode, we just added all this together, told it it had a CD-ROM drive, and attached the ISO. To download it to the geode, there's a program in the BIOS called Etherlink. This is quite handy. Um, basically, you put your file in a TFTP folder, start a server, and point Etherlink to it, and it's downloading. It is. It's very nice. Some of the software we put in, basically we put in anything that we would need for to be able to program on it. Also a webcam program that takes the images from the nose, cuts them up into JPEGs, and serves them out via Apache to a web page. Um, one thing I will mention is the wireless drivers Serial Monkey is one of the guys in our local log, so that's my little claim to fame, or his little claim to fame, which was pretty cool. My project. Now, my project consisted of robotic motion and camera stability. So what's so big about motion? Why do you need a project on robotic motion? If you can get an efficient walk, then it will have less power consumption. It will also spend less time in the processor, which leaves the processor to do other things like image processing. It will also give it a stable walk, so hopefully you're not going to spend the majority of your time on your back trying to get back up. And it looks better. When I was doing motion, when I was doing the motion, I had to figure out what shape I wanted each of the legs to go in. Now, we could have moved in a square, so going straight up, straight across, and straight down. Or we could have moved in a triangle, going straight up and straight down. Um, but it turns out that the most efficient walk is in an ellipse. It's also the most natural. I don't know about you, but I don't go around walking up and down all the time. It's a bit bizarre. So we grab the equation of an ellipse. We then have four constants that we can tweak to be able to get an efficient ellipse. Then we need to figure out, once we've figured out what points we need to get to, we need to figure out how to get there. Now, this would be fine if you only had, if your arm was just perfectly straight. Be a bit, it would be easier, but you have an elbow, as does the bear. So you need to figure out 
what angle you need to put your shoulder and what angle you need to put your elbow in order to get to the point that you want to go to. It turns out that the point that you want to go to is described by these equations. We need to reverse those. We want to find the angles that we need to put in to get to the points we want to go to. I tried this using simple maths, writing down on a piece of paper. I was going around in circles, but I wanted an ellipse. So I decided to use MATLAB. Now, MATLAB was quite simple. All I had to do, tell it the equations, plug in some values, and then it gave me out the answers that I wanted, which was quite handy. Darn it. Oh. Okay, now because of the sine and cos, you actually get two different angles out to get to the same point. So to get to here, we could use this angle coming in underneath the bear, or we could flip it over and use this angle. Now, if we use this one, then the center of gravity of the bear moves to the outside and it has to hold itself up more. If it's underneath, then the bear is able to keep the center of gravity underneath the bear and it's much easier to walk. So we want the one that keeps each leg underneath the bear. Zero communication. In order to get, in order to get my program, from on top of Linux through the operating system out to the serial communication, I had to go th through the operating system. On the plus side, Linux is POSIX standard. This meant that it had a standard interface as to how users interface to the operating system. It turns out that the serial port is treated like any other file. This is quite handy because all you have to do, open the file, read the file, write to the file, close the file. Nice and easy, what we've all done before. We had to configure a couple of serial communication parameters, board rates, control bits. Um, I ended up using this website as my Bible for serial communication. It was quite handy. Putting it all together. So we start off with MATLAB. We get it to solve our ellipses turn that to a CSV file, put the CSV file down to a spreadsheet, configure some offsets and some calibration stuff, send that out to a CSV, the C program reads my CSV file and outputs it to the motors. It looks confusing, but if I had a programmer, if I had a user who didn't know how to program in C, this means that they can either come in at the MATLAB stage and tell it to go to an ellipse and it's just going to do it, or they can come in at the spreadsheet stage and calibrate it to how they want to do it. Interfaces that they may be a little bit more familiar with. Camera stability. So why camera stability? If we can keep the camera stable, or if we can keep the head stable that has the camera in it, then the programmers are going to have to do less image processing. I'll show you some videos later, but if the head is not kept stable, then the head will start wandering off into the sky somewhere. You don't know what you're looking at. The object that you're trying to find while you're doing your image processing isn't in the picture in the first place. So it's easy to keep track of the object being followed. Also, it should decrease mechanical fatigue, making your motors last longer, even though I'm sure these things last for an in infinite amount of time. For stability, my first intentions, my lecturer's first intentions were to try and model where the head's going to be at any point in time by knowing where every other motor in the bear is at any point in time. This looked really confusing, it probably would have worked, not something I wanted to do when there was an easier way. The bear has an accelerometer in the head. 
The good thing about accelerometers, or this accelerometer, is it measures both static and dynamic acceleration. It can measure the force of gravity coming down upon it. It turned out that for static acceleration, if you move, if the inputs that you're getting in from your program move 100 points, then you've just moved from having 1g to 0g's force upon you, or 0g's to minus 1g force upon you. So to track the horizon, I tried, I had to keep x equal to 0. This Accelerometers are quite sensitive. You sit them on a table and it will still measure acceleration. This meant that when I designed my control system, I had to give it a little bit of an error margin. Then once I figured out how the inputs were coming in, I had to convert each of the inputs from the accelerometers out to a motor point so it essentially works out as a constant control system. The step response, when you design control systems, you're supposed to start with a step response. So I moved the head from 45 degree angle down to level, from minus 45 down to level. You can see it moves about 100 points when you do that. Videos aren't set up yet, are they? Oops. Hold on a moment. I can take questions if you would like. Uh, they're in the LCA folder. Um, you said just recently that you took tried to take step responses for your head. You've actually taken a um, a slope response, not a step response, because it's actually impos physically impossible to, to do a step response. So you're better off to attempt to do a, a slope response, and then you'll be able to more, uh, you'll be able to determine the dynamics of your system a bit better than what you've done. Um, it was about the closest thing I could do to taking a step response, so trying to move it down really quickly, as quickly as I was capable. Um, but sorry, I've forgotten the next part of your question. You can only take an approximate. So you yeah. So you know the oh. um, the other thing is I tried to ignore dynamic acceleration. So I tried to leave when I was going to see where the head was at any point in time until that had leveled out. Um, this meant that I was just looking for that change in 100 points and just trying to keep the head at that zero point, um, it's a very crude control system that doesn't look much like a control system, but it works. Yes. Oh, um, you good? Okay, which one do we have? Okay, so once I move the bear to the right spot, these are videos that are taken out of the head of the bear. So as you can see on the one on the right, yes, that the bin starts going out of where the video is following. So if you're trying to do some image processing on that, you're like, where's the bin, where's the bin? You're going to use up a heap of processing time, and it's never going to be there in the first place. The one on the left, it's a little bit jumpy, but it tries to keep the head in the picture, which means that those who are doing image processing would be able to find where the bin is or where the object that they're trying to follow is. Uh, next. Hold up a second. I have... Uh, you can continue. What protocol are you using to talk from the AVR chipset to the motors? Um, it's all serial communication, which is quite nice. So the um, line of the two header files and the ID and all that, you can speak out to the motors from anywhere. Um, I found some program in the AVR libs that does serial out. It's like some printf. 
stuff. Just wondering what uh, frequency your control loop's running at and how you uh, coped with delays in the serial port driver or whether you're using shared FIFO or anything like that to uh, control schedule problems. Yeah, the Atmel's run at 16 megahertz. Um, I do a little bit of waiting just to make sure that all the static, ex the dynamic acceleration has gone and it's back to level. When you see it walk, it's a very slow control system. It it works if you keep the bear stable. Once the bear starts walking at a decent pace, it yeah, doesn't quite work. There's much room for improvement. You ready? Okay. And now for the part you've all been waiting for. He's supposed to have a battery. They didn't get the batteries to me. So that's why it's running the cables. Um, we have TOS, but we don't have any whatsies. Oh. In the program. He's very cute. These are some videos we took the other night while we were trying to get John Oxer to do some patches on the bear. Hardware patches. If it works. Ah, oh, totem. Yeah, it helps if I send it to VLC instead of totem. So he can keep his head stable regardless of where he is. <laughs> so, yeah. These are the videos we took the other night. <laughs> it does. It looks much cuter with the plastic on. It looks more evil without it. <laughs> ah, done it. Sorry. I'm not used to it, Bantu. Go, go. There we go. This is when Taz doesn't have a seatbelt on. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> okay. Any more questions? Yes, I'll just stand here. Um, I'm curious as to why you you try to do um, optical image recognition with this computation extremely hard problem rather than just using laser scanning. Um, the question was, why are we using optical recognition for image processing instead of just laser scanning? The ABOs did it that way. That's what the RoboCop teams are used to. Yeah. That's what they're used to using. So. <coughs> Sorry? There are, but, sorry. We should upgrade from the geode, was the statement. Um, there are better processors out there. At the time, we had a choice of the geode. Like, This is about a two-year-old system now. So at the time, we had a choice of a geode or two other smaller processors. Turns out that the geode was better and a lot cheaper. And you can stream off with a video stream and hopefully do off-site processing. So hopefully, we can get it out the wireless process on your quad core and then 
send the information back and hopefully that won't be too delayed, but it's untested how, whether that works yet, so that was part of their idea. Any more questions? Anything you want me want the bear to do? Yep. You're currently using servers, so you've just got position control, and your movement's going from quite jerky to swift, right? Have you got any plans to upgrade so you can have a state that models the bear going internally so you can get a true walk happening rather than the jerky bear to jerky bear connection? Um should repeat the question. So the question was about state space systems. Um, at the moment, the servos have a very jerky movement. Um, so, sheesh, I'm forgetting questions already. This is bad. Um, the motors, like, they're running at 100 megabits per second. And you can send them, you can also determine what speed they're running at. So you can say, go to this position really fast or go to this position really slow. At the moment, I just have points listed down. You could put it in a loop. You could get information back from the motors going, when you're at this point, then go to the next point. Um, I don't know if that exactly answers your question. Torque, right? Yes, they can measure torque. Can measure the as well. Yes. You can measure if it's hit something and be able to react to it if you want to. Up the back. Yes, that is the theory. At the moment, our wireless doesn't work. Sorry, they didn't send us with an antenna. So our wireless does work, but it's not going to get very far. So. And it does exist, batteries, but we have to run it off power for the moment. How am I going for time? I have no idea. You don't have time. On. Five minutes? Awesome. Um, yeah. I don't think there's much other cool stuff I can make it do except walk along the ground or put TAS on it if someone has some tape. Yes? So is this like a production model that they're going to do to like, make sure that it's like competition? Or is it still like a prototype? It went to tender the tenders were in well the presentations for the tenders were in 2007 sadly the bear didn't win the tender it went to the naos which are my robot up in slide three come on go um. sorry yeah the they're cheaper. They come from France. Um, France has this really nice um, robotics, government-sponsored stuff. If you make robotics, then you get government discounts, whatever else. So I think they got in about $8,000 for this guy. Um, this bear comes in at $15,000 US dollars. What happened there? I think all the videos are causing a huge amount of I.O. weight. Oh, okay. Videos are causing I.O. weight. Funny about that. Um, so it was a lot cheaper. However, the software to program them on is $13,000 in itself. So it works out. An expensive robot. Yeah. They don't use free software, no. I don't know what software they do use, but it's not free, which is very disappointing. They, the, <laughs> the NAOs have plastic gears. These guys have metal gears, um, which does mean that the NAOs break very easily. The Newcastle team got a NAO. I think they turned it on for the first time, and they had to send it back. Sadly, they only gave them two before the r start of RoboCop. And... I don't know what version the NAOs are up to. There's, there's a, a new version that of the, of the NAOs that came out um, a few months ago, I think, the, the version 3. They're quite a lot more stable um, and break less quickly. 
Okay, apparently the Neos are up to version 3 now, which is probably a good thing. Um, but yeah, the original ones had lots of overheating issues. And yeah. Uh, we debated between ourselves whether we should put a Tribotics plug in. I decided after the last presentation when I smoked up some more of our equipment um, that we probably deserve to put a Tribotics plug in because we smoked our equipment up. They let us take the very expensive equipment out away from them and um, we can't afford to pay for it ourselves so we put in a bit of a plug for them. On the continuation of the plug, they also have these really nice, like the motors in these guys are the Dynamaxels, they're about $285 US dollars. They also have these little ones, which are the 35 US dollar ones up there. These are really nice, yes, yeah, spare. Shh. <laughs> um, apparently these are really nice to program on. Um, you can put your own program inside each of them. So I know someone's made a snake out of these guys. There's no microcontroller there. There's just all these little um, motors, which is quite nice. So and these are still quite hardy and very quality little motors. Okay. Yep. I think that's it. So thank you.